Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Erica Pixley, and I am the Associate Director of Admissions for the Office of Graduate Programs. Um, so I will am in charge of all of the MS programs, um, and I also help out with some of the PhD programs here as well. Um, so for today, our agenda, I'm just going to go over the graduate program outline and also give a um, short overview of the Shady Grove campus um, because this program is technically held at the Shady Grove campus and not our Baltimore campus. Um, so welcome again, everyone, to the virtual open house. Um, I will be taking you through the overview, like I said, of the MS in Medical Cannabis Science and Therapeutics program. And then afterwards, we will have a Q&A session with the MCST faculty, um, Dr. Chad Johnson, who is also the co-director of the MCST program, and Drs. Andy Coop and Tiffany Buckley and Kristen Cox, who is a current student in the program and our student ambassador. So she can answer any student related questions and doctors Coop, Johnson and Buckley can answer any program uh, related questions, homework, things like that. So please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself at the end and we will answer all of your questions. So, like I stated before, the universities at Shady Grove is located in Rockville, Maryland, and offers 80 different degree programs from nine different Maryland public universities, all housed on one campus. The universities at Shady Grove was established in 2000 and provides centralized student academic and administrative services. And currently, the School of Pharmacy has two programs housed there which are the MS in Medical Cannabis Science and Therapeutics and the MS in Pharmaceutical Sciences. Uh, so like I stated earlier, the, the on-campus portion will be held at the universities at Shady Grove and not at the Baltimore campus. The universities at Shady Grove offers computer labs, several study areas, a library, a cafe, a fitness center, and a bookstore. So if you do live in the Baltimore Rockville area, you can utilize all of these on campus um, facilities. Dr. Leah Sarah is the program director for the medical cannabis science and therapeutics program and Dr. Chad Johnson is co-director and Lisa Finn is the program manager. So you can reach out to any of us if you have any questions at any time. The Master of Science in Medical, the Master of Science in Medical Cannabis Science and Therapeutics program is the first graduate program in the nation dedicated to the study of medical cannabis. The development of this program was spurred by the need for an educated workforce to respond to the demand for medical cannabis as the number of states legalizing medical cannabis continues to rise. There is an increasing need to prepare and educate this workforce with advanced expertise and knowledge of the science and therapeutic effects of medical cannabis, and that's what this program aims to do. The program itself is a combination of online coursework coupled with our in-person symposium requirement. The symposium days are in-person events that happen a total of four times throughout the duration of the program in the fall and spring of each academic year. The symposium takes place at our universities at Shady Grove Campus in Rockville, Maryland, and students interact with fellow classmates, faculty, staff, medical cannabis experts, and industry professionals during these events. The picture you see on the right is the inaugural class of 2021 at the first symposium held in the fall of 2019. This is a two year, 30 credit part-time program. Each course runs for eight weeks and you are generally only taking one course at any given time. The program is designed to accommodate working professionals and is accessible to anyone who is interested in a career in the medical cannabis field and has completed an undergraduate degree. 
In state tuition is $650 per credit hour and out of state tuition is $816 per credit hour. All applications and supplemental materials must be received and processed by June 1st and to be considered for the fall 2022 class. Unofficial transcripts will be accepted for review and conditional acceptance and official transcripts must be received no later than August 1st, 2022. Applications are reviewed in the order in which they are marked complete and admissions is offered on a rolling basis. So applying early is definitely encouraged. The next two slides contain the general course outline for the program for year one and year two. The curriculum itself provides education in basic sciences, including pharmacology, chemistry, and medical cannabis delivery systems. The clinical uses of medical cannabis, including the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of conditions, the adverse effects and public health considerations of medical cannabis, and medical cannabis federal and state laws and policies. The first professional year consists of students taking four required foundational courses in medical cannabis, science, therapeutics, and policy, as well as the first medical cannabis symposium requirements. The summer after the first year is when students begin choosing elective courses based on their area of interest. Students are required to complete a total of four electives, generally taking at least one in the summer. Some students choose to take two electives in the summer because in order to qualify for financial aid, you must be registered for at least six credits. All of our electives are three credits each. This slide gives you the breakdown of the second professional year of the program. As you can see, much of the two years consists of taking elective courses. Students also complete the capstone courses in the fall and spring of their second year, and listed here are also the seven possible electives we offer. I'll just leave this up for a second so you can review all of the elective courses. This degree is designed to prepare graduates for competitive careers in the medical cannabis industry. We anticipate graduates of the program will have increased potential for securing a position in the medical cannabis field, and our graduates will be able to support patients in the medical cannabis industry with expertise regarding the science and clinical effects of the cannabis plant. They will be able to contribute to existing scientific and clinical medical cannabis research and they will be able to contribute to the development of well-informed medical cannabis policy. The application checklist includes the online application, which is a history of your educational background and your job history, a $75 non-refundable application fee, your resume or CV, an admission essay that's about 500 words explaining why you want to receive this degree, how you plan on using it, official transcripts for all universities attended, and as I stated earlier, unofficial transcripts can be used. And then if you are admitted, you'll need to supply us with your official transcripts. Three letters of professional recommendation, and I believe the website says uh, they come from previous fa um, faculty or instructors that you've had, but they can be letters of professional recommendation or letters from previous faculty. They just cannot come from friends or family members. And international applicants will need to supply an official TOEFL score or an official ILET score that was taken within the last two years. For general inquiries, you can email us at sopgradadmissions at rx.umaryland.edu or the program email is msmcst at rx.umaryland.edu. And that is it for the presentation part. So now I will open it up for questions and answers so you can 
post your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask a question and I will go back to the screen that has the names of everyone who is in attendance today. So if you have questions, you can just go ahead and, and call out somebody's name or you can just ask. Christina, it looks like you have a question. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, hi, thank you and hello everyone. I am, I know, I am calling from, I'm connecting from Canada. Um, so it's quite interesting because I'm a dietitian here in Canada, but I'm not able to really practice as a cannabis educator, which is really interesting. Um, however, I kind of struggled, and I think I connected with you that I, I was trained in Colombia, and then I have two all my transcripts have in Colombia, but then I'm practicing here as a registered dietitian. So how will I kind of get all those transcripts? Like I really want to apply for the fall. Um, so let's see if you can give me <laughs> shed some light on that. If you have um, your unofficial transcripts, were you are your transcripts in English? I do have some from, and I even have like an equivalency that it was kind of done many years ago by the University of Toronto saying that like the program that I did was equivalent to a bachelor's of science in nutrition. Okay. Um, so I had that letter from the University of Toronto and also the kind of official transcripts in translating into, into English. But then, so if I get the official transcript, they will be in Spanish though. I would um, send us what you have from the University of Toronto and send us that first and we can review it. And if needed, you can do a West ICAP evaluation, which is a course by course evaluation and Wes um, would send us the official evaluation. Um, so that would basically be the same as what you've done through Toronto. I just don't know if that I would uh, send me that I'll send it to the grad school and see if we can use that as the official. Um, okay, and the other 2 questions I have, I know I've been practicing and I've been in Canada for over 15 years and I still have to take the TOEFL, right? <laughs> uh, you're a Canadian citizen. Yes. Um, I don't believe you would need to, but because you are taught in Columbia, um, once you submit your online application, if it's required, the TOEFL will come up, but you can always, if it's required, then you can apply for a TOEFL waiver. Um, and that would be through the graduate school and I can email you the application checklist, which has the TOEFL waiver information in it. Okay, and sorry, and my last question is, are you going to have any any elective related to psychedelics since <laughs> I'm curious. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, Andy Coop here. Um, so, along with Dr. Johnson, um, he and I teach many of the basic science courses and um, we have been planning new electives that Dr. Buckley and I hopefully will talk about some of the courses in a second. Um, psychedelics, uh, at least from the basic science side, um, we have been talking about um, coordinating with Johns Hopkins, which is just across the street from us, um, from our Baltimore campus, where a lot of the clinical research, um, especially into psilocybin, is actually being performed. So we are currently um, starting negotiations with them. So short answer is there's nothing on the books yet, but that is one of the areas we would love to incorporate into the program, yes. Okay, thank you. So my name is Jason Davis. Um, I am from Portland, Oregon. And I am uh, currently a pharmacy technician at OHSU. Can um, are you guys be able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I have a couple questions. Um, after completion of the pharmacy, going to be going on like a year rotation or having to do like a residency. 
Hey, hey, Jason, could you do me a favor? Could you repeat that? Uh, a big, uh, a large chunk of that got cut out as, okay. you started, as you began talking. Sorry about that. I'm sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so no are we going to have to do a residency after completion of the program? No, no, no. There's no residency associated with the program. It, the, the only thing that's involved in completion of the program is the capstone project at the end. But there will there won't be any residency anywhere. No. Okay. And um, this is for it's on the website. Um, it wasn't really spoken in the um, presentation, but it says that a minimum of a 3.0 is preferred. Uh, if I had in the last two years of my undergrad, I had a GPA of like a cumulative 3.6, but my overall GPA isn't a 3.0, can I still apply for the program? Jason, yeah, you you absolutely can. Uh, you know, that's you know, we we put some we put some some criteria on the website to kind of set a benchmark. But you know, on your application, you'll notice when you have to fill it in. There's several other factors that go into us making a decision um, upon you being admitted into the program. So I would say definitely yes, still apply. Awesome, it's, thank you so much. It, it is a holistic review. Um, we are looking for a diverse class in every single way. We feel that that really brings all aspects to this field as we grow the professionalism of this field. We're looking for all diversity. So um, a holistic review, one thing is not going to hold you back. So we look at you as an overall person of how we get a strong, interactive, diverse class. I really appreciate that aspect. Thank you. Um, and then I guess my, my last question, um, uh, so the, we have to have like, uh, I guess you call it the synopsis. Um, and so you have to come to Shady Grove once a term or for a lab or something like that. Is that correct? So, so it's, so it's once a semester for the, for the fall and the spring symposium. Um, right. and, then, and that will be, you know, those dates will be set well in advance. So you can plan travel, uh, if need be, we, during, during the pandemic, we pivoted virtual, uh, but since we've, you know, we're trying to do it back in person again, but, um, but yes, it'll be once a semester that you'll need to show up. And that's for two, how, you know, how many days that is. Uh, they, uh, they're for a day long symposium. Okay. Yep, so it'll be from from morning till evening. So a lot of students I know they they typically arrive a day or two before they and then they interact with the classmates, have a little time, and then you have a full day in the symposium with um, you know plenary speakers, uh, you know sub uh, mini symposiums covering subtopics in cannabis, and also um, and also panel panel reviews where people in industry, uh, people in um, you know. Uh, the growing aspect of it, people in law, entrepreneur, you'll hear from a bunch of different perspectives. That'll be part of the afternoon session. Um, and then after that, that's uh, that's it. Awesome. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything else that I have to um, ask. Um, I think I think you guys covered it. So I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you for having it. And I've um, got a lot more information now, and I. I'm really excited about the program and I'm happy that it's existing because um, I think so it's really, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Jason. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks Jason. Um, and typically these symposiums are held on a Friday. So then you have, you can come in Thursday and then you have them Friday and then you can stay for the weekend or you can go home if you need to. Um, we do have a message. Um, do you have many PharmD students from other universities who do this program simultaneously? And is that possible? And can they incorporate this into their curriculum? Dr. Coop, you may uh, you may want to speak up speak up to that one. Um, I was going to let Dr. Buckley answer one question, but I can quickly answer this. Um, in terms of incorporating these courses into your current degree um, course, that is something that we would need to work out with the grad school. Um, it's something we need to work out with the grad school. Being enrolled in two courses, two different institutions at the same time does have financial aid implications. Um, there are financial aid implications for each of the institutions, so it's it's it, it can be done, but it's it, it just needs it's tricky. Um, so we just need to make sure we do things correctly, obviously. 
So um, we have had many, many individuals who have a pharmacy, who are pharmacists, who then take this degree afterwards. In addition to that, we have just, just created a PharmD MS Cannabis dual degree for our own PharmD pharmacy program. Um, so that is for our own program so that a student who has a pharmacy degree or obtaining a pharmacy degree at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy can actually take the um, MS courses for electives as part of the PharmD at Maryland. That, because it's one institution, the agreements we have are those agreements in place. Now for outside institution, that becomes a lot more difficult and it's something that we would need to talk about one-on-one -on -one to work out your individual situation. Dr. Buckley, would you like to add anything to that? Sure, I can just jump in. So this is in the works, but not completely done yet. We're trying to set up a medical cannabis clinic site that students could come to, um, pharmacy students could come to and get some practice experience. So there are things on the books, but we're still working through everything. And just to piggyback off of what Dr. Coop said earlier, um, if you are a current PharmD student at another university and you wanna take the MS program here, um, like he said, it can be done. You would need permission from the program director, um, but you would not be able to use financial aid, so you would have to pay cash for this program. But there are programs that I have um, been program manager for before at UMB where students from other institutions did this and they did an, um, another MS program and they just were a cash pay student. So you would just have to, you wouldn't be able to take out financial aid. And this is why it's very much um, on the individual basis. And these are not our rules. Um, these are obviously regulations um, because financial aid is obviously we need to make sure we cover things for your benefit as well as for ours, for everyone's benefit that we follow all regulations appropriately because we don't want to get in trouble or anyone to get any bills they don't expect. Um, so that's why we want to make sure that everyone, obviously, we take this very, very serious. Plus workload. It's a very heavy workload if you do two programs at the same time. So that's something else to consider. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I'm Mike Masseri here. I'm from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. I, once again, I appreciate everybody's time. I'm putting this together. It's uh, very beneficial and I appreciate everybody's time here. Um, I loved hearing that you guys are expanding on the program as it's going on uh, with the research and different psychedelics and then maybe some research labs and some stuff like that. Um, are there any recent graduates that you guys have retained uh, for kind of like research and development or uh, internal possibilities as this program expands? So um, I'll answer that. Um, we have just, just graduated our first class. Uh, that was <laughs> I so, knew I knew we were very in the beginning. Oh, it, it, wonderful! It was great. It was fantastic. So we have just graduated our first class um, just this last summer. So it was absolutely wonderful um, to see those individuals um, graduate. Well, unfortunately, we had to do it virtually. Unfortunately, with the way the world is, but we have indeed. Um, working with one of those graduates, so I actually spoke to him this week, last week. Um, as actually um, helping us and has come back to actually teach one of the courses. So we've actually had one, um, um, one, one graduate, sorry, alumnus, um, actually come, I'm trying to think of the word, I can't think of the word, um, come back and actually help teach. So that's where we currently are. The aim is yes, as we um, grow and have a greater number. Now, as I said earlier, we have individuals, and I'm not sure whether Ms. Pixley actually talked about the demographics of the class and the areas, but about half our class um, has some sort of science medical background generally. 
and about half has no medical science background, so a range of individuals. So we all all have different ambitions, different visions for what they want to do with this degree, and we encourage them all. So many of them, um, some of them work in, say, analytical labs, and they want to grow in the analytical labs. Some are CEOs of companies, you know, cannabis companies, and they want to have that education to professionalize them, the MS in medical cannabis science and therapeutics behind their name. So there's very different reasons for doing it. So to answer your question, as the number of graduates grow, we would be looking to do that. Um, and really, it's such a it's such a nascent field that we are looking for you to help us as we grow this program. Absolutely, that was very insightful, and I appreciate it. We do have students come in and talk at our symposium too. We have a whole bunch of different sessions, breakout sessions. So we have people come back and talk about what they've done. It's it's pretty remarkable because people graduate the program and they already they're off the ground running. They for those ones that had visions about what they wanted to do, a lot of them are already working in the medical cannabis field, affecting change, whether that be through advocacy, starting their own businesses. But um, I am really impressed by the people that we've graduated so far. <laughs> I will say I do teach an advanced clinical elective. So I teach the advanced cannabis therapeutics for neuropsychiatric disorders. And my classes are always about 50-50 clinicians and non-clinicians. So for people who are already licensed healthcare practitioners, you have your pharmacists, your physicians, dietitians and such, I structure the class for them a little bit differently than people who are non-clinicians. However, everyone walks out of the class knowing <clears throat> risk and benefits of cannabinoid therapy in different conditions and how to counsel the general public on that information. So I think we've done a good job trying to um, make sure that we have information that non-clinicians can take forward and use and that clinicians can already use to just kind of bolster their practice as well. I really appreciate that you guys tailor it to individual student needs too. I think that'll go a long way. Oh, and can I just continue on that, Dr. Buckley, please? Um, I saw a question come in chat, but if I can just say one thing, Dr. Buckley was talking about clinicians and non-clinicians from her side of things. One of the biggest questions um, Dr. Johnson and I get is because we, um, the two of us, oversee the science courses. So I'm sure you saw on these slides that we have a range of science courses. There was PDA in pharmacology, there was chemistry in drug delivery, there was pharmacogenomics, and um, and then there was analytical. Um, those four science courses, Dr. Johnson and I are heavily involved in all four of those courses. And one of the questions we get at situations like this, the open house, and especially the symposium, there's a, there's a line wanting to talk to us at this, oh, they're wonderful, by the way. Imagine having a hundred and something cannabis professionals in a room at the same time. Oh, it's <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. So, is, I haven't done science for 30 years, and <clears throat> I can't put it any other way, and I, I don't mean this insulting to anybody, but what an individual have actually said this to me is, I'm scared. I haven't done science for 30 years. Or, and when I did, I didn't do much of it. Um, and I, I'm a lawyer, or, you know, I, I've not done science. And what we say to them, Dr. Johnson and I, is our aim is to make the courses valuable to everyone, but accessible to all. That is what we say. Now we make them accessible to all. You can see we're here. I mean, Dr. Buckley's here, Dr. Johnson's here, I'm here. We're here. We do um, office hours so you can talk to us. It's not just all online, all asynchronous. We all do office hours. And I see Dr. Buckley nodding there. Um, but we make it accessible to all. So I said that to the very first class at the very first symposium. We were back in person then. When we just graduated the class just this summer we talked about, 
uh, we had a little a virtual celebration and I asked them, I said, did I, did, did, you know, did I follow through on my promise? And pretty much they said, yeah, you did. You made it accessible to all and valuable. And that is our aim. And I just wanted to say that because it does piggyback on what Dr. Buckley was saying about the clinicians. We know we have a range um, of uh, backgrounds and that's great, it's wonderful. But it also is, is challenging. And, and that's one of the reasons we do this. But we also give ad optional advanced readings for those individuals that might have more experience. So we do, although it's quite a large class, um, we really value that personal touch with the individual student. So I just wanted to say that um, at this point. I think we. Yeah, I, I appreciate you putting that in there for sure. That's 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 great. Thanks, Mike. You're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And one last thing. So. On the clinical side, <laughs> we I, I have had a few. We've had a few students who have gone on to pursue advanced um, healthcare degrees after completing this program. Some of our students have gone on to become psychologists as well as pharmacists, which is really exciting because then they'll get even more knowledge through this cannabis lens and really be able to help patients in so many different ways. So that's really exciting as well. Thank you. There was a question that came in during the um, into chat. How do you see this program applying to nursing practice? Dr. Buckley, I think you're a perfect person for this. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad you asked that. So <clears throat> the nurse is a vital part of the team and it's important that everyone on the team is educated about the about cannabinoids. In my class right now, I have a lot of people who are nurse practitioners who they work in states where they can even do some recommending and certifying of cannabis. So I think it's very important for them to understand, at least in my class, what we go over is the literature and understanding the holes in that literature and why those exist talking about the benefits of cannabinoid therapy, talking about the harms of cannabinoid therapy, and being able to apply all that evidence in an evidence-based way to a patient to provide excellent care. So I feel like it's just so instrumental for nurses to be part of, to know as much as possible about cannabis, to also serve as educators on their team to other people who might not know. Um, in Canada, so medical cannabis clinics where they're multidisciplinary, <clears throat> still kind of a work in progress, but Canada does have some literature about some clinics that they have, and they have a care team that consists of a nurse who primarily does screening of acceptability for patients, who does education on can cannabinoids, and then goes over dosing at the end. Um, also on that team is a physician as well as a social worker. So there's a place for everybody within your scope of practice. Hi, this is Christina. Just to add that in Canada, nurse practitioners can actually pres not prescribe, like write medical documents. So it's not really a prescription. Um, so I think, um, I guess we can learn a lot, right? From the experience, the Canadian experience. And it's not like I plan for this. <laughs> So funny, um, but uh, the reason I really want to do this program is because of Cody Patterson and he's the pharmacist oh. who I connected with since last year. And I think his, the way he breaks down can, can, uh, cannabis science into really digestible, <laughs> um, I guess, bites. I, I just love his approach and that's really, he's really the reason why I approached and I want to apply for this program. Excellent. Glad to hear it. We'll have to reach out to Cody. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, I, I had a couple more questions. I'm not, I'm sorry if I'm speaking twice. Um, is it okay to ask? Another Absolutely. Question? Fire okay. away. Um, so I, I'm, um, obviously I said I'm from Portland, Oregon, and um, our, my state has been involved in the um, medical cannabis um, usage for quite some time now. Um, I've actually had um, myself, not so much, I guess, clinical work, 
but I've, you know, I've grown um, for the past 12 years myself. And so um, I guess, does this program, or, or will we be growing in this program or just learning, I guess, like the science behind it? And um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's the question. So Dr. Coop, you can piggyback off me if you want, uh, <laughs> but, but, but so, so, so long story short, no. Uh, there, there won't be anything covered on, uh, there won't be anything covered on growing on growing techniques. As well as anything entrepreneurial, so, like, starting a business, um, right. and that had that has to do with certain legal constraints um, with us being a state institution that we have placed on us. So, uh, it, it, it will be mentioned, but we can't discuss techniques of how right. to about of how to go about growing. Or about starting business about starting a business. So, like I said, just mentioned, but it'll be a very, very 10,000 foot. View versus, you know, diving deep into the subjects. Right. Um, does that, does that, that yeah, help ahead. my back? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Would, um, so would, would that help my, my app, my background, my application? This, you know, having years and experience in the field, or does that not really count as years and experience in the field? Oh, absolutely it counts. Uh, absolutely it does. And, uh, and there's a, there's a place in the application where we ask. Do you have experience in the medical cannabis field? And, okay. and you do, uh, if, if you've been involved in that, you absolutely do. And so we, we do take that into account. Yes. Thank you so much. And, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, is, and there's financial aid available for the program. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was covered. Uh, Ms. Pixley for that 1, I think. Yes. Yes, you can apply for financial aid um, and for financial aid. You have to have 4 credits or 6 credits um, to get financial aid. So you would just, so that's why in the summer, some students choose to take 2 classes so they can get financial aid or. Um, you can take out more a little bit more money than you need and save it in your refund check to pay for your summer course. Um, which is what most of the students do if they can't pay out of pocket, because um, it's probably about four or $5,000 for the course. Um, so, yes, so you can either take 2 classes or you can take out more financial aid than you need. Save that refund check to pay for your summer course. Okay, and um, I'm considering actually moving to Maryland. Um, I'm originally from Jersey, but I've, been, I, but I've been working and living out in Oregon for um, the last 10 to 15 years, but I'm considering moving back to the East Coast. Um, do you know what Maryland needs to, as, or to, um, I guess, right. yeah, well, what, what they need proof for, you know? You would have to have lived here for at least one year um, and to apply for in-state tuition. Excellent. Um, so, as soon okay. as you move here, get a driver's license um, because that will be one of the requirements that you submit. Um, and um, the the fall term, the the application, um, we, um, the University of Maryland needs to have that in by June. Is there any classes I could maybe like take um, at well, I don't know the university I went to was Portland State. So, is there any classes that I could take to like help me prepare for the program um, coming up? Like, I could take like an, uh, a minor or something, or you know, uh, maybe a chemistry class or um, something like that. So, so Jason, if you don't mind me asking, what what is your background? What did you study? So, I have a degree in social science. So, my I guess I um, mainly consist of. Um, Psychology classes, sociology. Um, okay. I don't have a, a heavy science science background. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if 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 you were interested in doing something like that, to you know, sort of take a quote unquote prep course, which is you know something that we don't, you know, we don't require anybody to do. But if you're if you look at you know some of the uh, required courses, you know, say on the website or something, if Something looks like it. It might be particularly challenging to you, uh, challenging to you, especially the basic sciences. You know, it, any sort of basic chemistry, um, you know, basic biology, anything like that. You know, so when you see terms, you're familiar with them. Um, 
but you know, I'll, you know, a lot of the stuff sort of builds on, you know, a lot of stuff is organic chemistry based because it is cannabinoids, but, you know, we would never expect you to go through, you know, an entire minor just to take the course, like Dr. Coop said, and Dr. Buckley said, we, we keep the courses accessible to all. So, even if you don't have a, a hard science background, you'll still be able to walk away with some, not only some new, not only some new knowledge, but, uh, you know, it'll also build, build some fundamental, you know, latest sort of the foundation of the future basic science courses as well. So, um, if you feel the need to take a, you know, kind of a prep course by all means, but, uh, but. I, I would I would encourage you to trust us in that regard that we have designed the program that even for those that don't have a science background, um, it will still be accessible and valuable to you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course. And I'll just chime in. I completely stand behind what Dr. Johnson has said there. I know in my class, I teach about advanced neuro, sorry. Advanced Cannabis Therapeutics for Neuropsychiatric Conditions, and I have a whole module in the beginning that goes over neurobiology. I start with what is the nervous system and go through that. So it's kind of a crash course for people who maybe aren't as familiar with the content, but there are a ton of links and a lot of videos that try to make it as accessible as possible. And as Dr. Koob and Dr. Johnson have highlighted, we also all have office hours at least once a week where you can see us face to face. Those office hours are recorded for students who can't attend, so they can always check out that content later. I have a cyber cafe in my class where people constantly write questions and I respond to those. So there are a lot of resources. In addition, your classmates, you have such a diverse group of classmates. I've heard that the culture is good in terms of people helping each other learn information. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this. This is this is awesome. Great. As a way, as a way. <laughs> um, we have a question for our student ambassador. What is the workload like for those who work full time and is it doable? Yes, it's doable. Um, I work full time. Luckily, I'm working from home right now. Um, and as uh, the others on the panel have mentioned, they structure the courses so that you don't feel, I guess, like bogged down. You know, if you don't have necessarily a very sciencey background, you know, you can actually feel like you're learning something from the course, not just, you don't feel like you're just trying to do the work, you know, just to get it done and get it submitted, you actually feel like you're taking things in and you're actually retaining the information. Um, and I think that the amount of work that they give, it makes it, it makes the work school home life balance, I think fairly easy for me anyway, like I don't have kids, so that's not something, you know, I have to worry about, but um, my job is fairly demanding, but I don't have a, you know, I don't have any issues with completing my work in a timely manner. You know, it's not overwhelming. It's not stressful. You know, um, I hope that answered the question. Are there any more questions for our student um, ambassador? Can I piggyback on that too? <laughs> um, <laughs> Just as an instructor in the course, I, we, I understand, we understand that everybody has life going on. So in my class, I just ask that if there's an emergency or something going on where people can't complete assigned classwork, they just let me know. And then we can come up with a plan together instead of them not communicating at all and kind of falling off the wagon. We have just intermittent check-ins with people. I know that I send out an email once a week and so does Dr. Koo because I'm on one of his classes to just make sure that everyone's on the same page. But there's always communication going on and to make sure that we are meeting our students uh, where they are, but they're also we're also holding them to high expectations at the same time. There was, and I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Ms. Cox. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, the 
instructors are so accessible. I mean, they make it so easy for you to reach out and they actually respond to you, you know, in a reasonable time, you know, time. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say they, if you, if you have an issue, say you have to go, to, you know, do something for work, do something with your children or whatever, as long as you communicate that with your instructor, I think you won't have any problems. They're accessible, they're flexible, you know, as long as you're not taking advantage of it, you know, but mm -hmm. as long as you communicate, you know, they will find a way to work with you so that you can complete your assignments and get them turned in, you know, so you can get your good grades. There was a question in the chat about how is content delivered? And I just wanted to address that if that's okay. Um, when we designed this program, um, the very philosophy from day one, because I was involved from day one, was that our um, students, our student body, are going to be overwhelmingly working professionals. So we took that as a given that our students are going to be working professionals. If students are working professionals, they have jobs during the day as well as everything else, as I think Dr. Buckley said, and Ms. Cox said, life, right? We all have life, but we all have jobs. So therefore, when we were designing this, what we decided was that we're not, except for the symposium, we're not going to design this, that you have to be in a certain place at a certain time, because you have life, you have a job. So the vast majority, the vast majority is asynchronous. We have the symposia because, and they are really valuable. We offer these office hours that Dr. Buckley mentioned, but we tape them, we record them and post them. And you, we have these cyber cafes. So if you want a question answered, you could submit a question and we'll answer it there, or you could attend and we'll answer it there. So you have the opportunity to interact with us live but we also deliver it so that you can do things asynchronously, except for the symposium. So you've got the best of both worlds. You can be your life around it and it's asynchronous, or you can actually attend all these things. So how do we assess? Do we give you exams? Do you have to sit down at a certain time and take an exam at 9 a.m.? No, no. Things are delivered like assignments. Now, there may be exams, but you can take them at any time you want. Um, there may be quizzes, but you can take them when you want. So we offer the opportunity to interact with us. And office hours very much, I mean, actually, Dr. Buckley, my office hours go like this. Right? I don't know about you, but my office hours go like this, just chatting with each other um, and going over topics. You have the opportunity to interact with us synchronously, but you also have the opportunity to be completely asynchronous, except for the symposium, if you'd like. So we designed it with you in mind. Um, I have a one another question. After completion of the program, are we considered pharmacists or do you have to go to keep going to school to become a pharmacist? You that the latter option uh, that you mentioned, uh, yes. Yeah, so this is you know this this is a this is an MS degree, um, not a not a farm D. So those are those are two separate distinctions uh, and hence two separate programs. Um, but the, yeah, so um, you know you'll you'll be considered an MS, but you'd have to attend a separate pharmacy school to to get the farm D title. And if you'd like to know more about the other degrees and the differences, please reach out to one of us, any of us, um, Dr. Buckley, myself, Dr. Johnson, and we can certainly go over the differences between the two because they are very, very different degrees with very different expectations and very different delivery methods. And the last thing we want is someone to sign up for a degree that's not what they expect. That's why we're here to explain it all to you because we want you to know because we want you to enjoy it and we want it to be valuable for you. Yes, there's definitely a place for everyone, but it is important that since this is a medical cannabis program that people stay within their scope that they're trained. So we we do, especially in my class, I really kind of harp on that. There, I, 
there are only certain things I can teach you in this course, depending on what your, your de degree is, but I can still teach you a lot. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Are there any other questions? Well, not from me. Thank you, everyone. I got to sign out, but I'm looking forward to submitting my application. Thank you so much. Okay, excellent. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for attending, everybody. Christine. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Great to see many of you today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.